SJC 13438, Commonwealth v. Mark Davidson. Okay, Attorney Rangavis. Good morning. <laughs> May it please the court. David Rangavis for the Commonwealth. Uh, this case is an attorney general enforcement action alleging a violation of anti-discrimination and consumer protection laws by a landlord who withdrew an offer to renew a lease uh, because some of his tenants, tenants who were present in the courtroom today, uh, told him they were expecting a child. So the Mr. case Rangavis, comes. Did, did you get notice of the transfer to the housing court? Uh, not. I got notice of the transfer to the, uh, to the housing court the day the case was transferred yeah, to the so housing court. Because was there an objection filed? Or were you heard on it? Well, I filed a motion in the housing court to transfer the case back. Right, but on, in the uh, superior court, did you have a chance? Th there to was no us? opportunity to file an objection. The case was closed, and the case was opened in the housing court. And I filed a motion to transfer back to the housing court. But, and when that so was, the Essex Superior Court never informed you? Correct, because I think it's something that happens at the clerk's office level. It was, it's not a motion to transfer. It was filed as a notice to transfer. Mm -hmm. So the case, it happens autom not automatically in the sense that it actually happens without human intervention. But I think a, someone in the clerk's office just did it. This, they, did it they closed the case the same day the notice was filed. Okay. That, that um, was so the case went back. Automatically, so the case is here on an interlocutory posture, obviously on sua sponte transfer, raising a core jurisdictional issue and a couple of issues that follow from that. Um, so first to jurisdiction, uh, attorney general enforcement actions under general laws chapter 151B, section five have exclusive jurisdiction in the superior court. And there's a few indications of legislative intent to that effect. Uh, the first is the language of general laws, uh, 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 chapter 151B, section five, which states that the attorney general shall commence and maintain a civil action on behalf of the complainant in the superior court. And I would submit that commence and maintain mean exactly what they say. The case has to be commenced in the superior court and it has to be maintained there. Maintained uh, is pretty specific. Maintained <laughs> is pretty specific. It's an, um, odd, an odd wording. Um, it, it, it is sort of unusual wording and I think makes it sort of unusually clear mm. that this is a case that has to be in the superior court. I think it's even more clear, my second indication of legislative intent is contrasting section five with section nine. Section nine is the statute that allows the, the private individual who's affected by the discriminatory act to file their own civil cause of action. And that says that they can file in the superior court or if the case involves residential housing, they can file in the housing court. Um, and then the third indication of legislative intent is the legislative history that I laid out in my brief that this statute was written after the housing court was created. And the legislature specifically wrote section nine to allow a private case to go to the housing court, but section five to allow attorney general enforcement actions to only go to superior court. Um, and there are, uh, there's a whole sort of line of cases uh, that have read the jurisdiction of the housing court actually fairly narrowly. Um, and to, to tap you into that line of cases, um, I would cite the court to Murphy versus Miller, uh, Justice Milkey's opinion from the Appeals Court 75, Mass Appeals Court 210, which is for a 2009 case that cites all of the other cases that have done this. But the court has sort of again and again made clear that the housing court is a court of limited jurisdiction. And even though 185C section three is seemingly broad, it's read narrowly again and again by both this court and by the Appeals Court. Um, the, if the court has no questions about sort of that core jurisdictional issue, um, uh, the second and third issues that follow from it. So the, uh, the, the, the second issue in the case is basically uh, what is a lower court to do in this sort of situation? And, and this court has repeatedly said that the courts that are facing a difficult jurisdictional question should report the case to the chief justice of the trial court for the chief justice under 211B section three to assign the case to a different trial court department. This court said that in St. Joseph's Polish National Catholic Church case that is cited in my brief, and there's a couple of other cases where the court said it as well, the LeBlanc v. Sherman Williams, uh, 406 Mass 888, and the Ryan v. Kehoe case, uh, 408 Mass 636. Um, uh, and then the transferring court, as I laid out in my brief, should at least review these sorts of notices to see if there's an obvious jurisdictional defect. Um, like it going forward, if it's an attorney general enforcement action under 151B, you would hope the transferring court would not make that transfer to the housing court. I'm sure they're not transferring employment discrimination cases to the housing court, so there is some review that's happening. So I would submit that if there's an obvious jurisdictional defect, you would hope the transferring court would review that and try to fix that as well. Um, and the third issue uh, in the case is just sort of clarifying trial court rule 12. 
uh, the housing court judge, when I was before him on my motion to transfer the case back to Superior Court, Justice Gaziano said that the thing that I should do is uh, file a letter to the Chief Justice under uh, Trial Court Rule 12. But Trial Court Rule 12, uh, its, in, its opening words are, if two or more actions are pending, the point is to consolidate multiple cases that are related to one another. And th there's only ever been one case pending. It, it's been in, it's ping ponged through multiple courts, but it's always ever only been one case that's active. Um, and so uh, this court can make clear, I think, for, for lower court judges that Rule 12 is really reserved for that sort of situation where multiple related cases are pending in different court departments do, and they can be joined together. You, you, your brief um, lays out the legislative history in the, in, the, in, the hist in, the, in the statutory interpretation well. The only question I had was, do we really have to get into the federal equivalency because there is no federal housing court? There's a, tri there's a trial court. Yes. So there's, 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 I, don't, I don't know if it's apples and oranges. Yeah, there's, there, it is a little bit apples and oranges. There's, there is only one federal court of general jurisdiction. Right. And, and our position is that. But I don't know if we need to reach it to, 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 to decide this issue. I definitely don't think you need to reach it. I, to be perfectly honest, if the single justice that reported the case hadn't uh, noted this issue, I probably wouldn't have reached it either. <laughs> Um, so I don't think the court needs to discuss that issue in, in its decision. I think the, the language of the statute is certainly clear enough without getting into this con compare and contrast with federal law. And can I ask a sort of a, an odd question? So yes. if so, you can bring an individual case in housing court. What do, and I'm just trying to understand if we had an individual case here and we had an AG case, does it would have to be in the superior court? I take it. You, 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 the consolidation would have to be in the Superior Court, right? I think it would have to, yeah, because of commence and maintain, because of the fact that there's only jurisdiction in the Housing Court under Section 5, or in the Superior Court under Section 5. Um, you mean it would have, I'm sorry. No, no. Just would have to be, couldn't they, they operate parallel? Oh, yes, they could op operate parallel. If someone in, filed, in the case that you wanted consolidation for some reason. If someone sent a letter to the Chief Justice of the Trial Court under Trial Court Rule 12, one of them consolidated, that consolidation would have to be in Superior Court. But of course, related cases don't have to be consolidated. I was just going to ask, the um, Housing Court judge didn't think um, they had the power to transfer it back, right? Correct. Do you think they did? Well, I, I think the... I know I, you think they sh it shouldn't have been transferred to begin with. But. No, I, I think the thing to do that this court has sort of said repeatedly is that the Chief Justice of the Trial Court unambiguously has that power to transfer cases between court departments. So the thing a, a, court, a judge in a court of limited jurisdiction should do in that situation is just report the case to the Chief Justice of the Trial Court for that interdepartmental transfer to happen. Um, and he, declined, he, he declined to seek the assistance of the CGM. Because his view was that I had to follow trial court rule, rule 12, which for the reasons I've laid out, two or more cases are pending. This was only one case. I didn't think I could do that. And that's why I went to the single justice and yada, yada, yada. Now here we are. <laughs> the the, sing, the um, <laughs> chief, chief administrative justice's power, is that a statutory power or is that a rule? It's a statutory po power under, I believe it's general laws, chapter 211B, section 9. Can I just ask, so did you... When, when the housing judge said, no, no, you have to follow Rule 12, did you respond to that or did you just bring it to the uh, single justice? I, well, in, in real time, you mean? Well, I mean, no, I, I, I'm assuming there were written back I, and forth. Were, there were were there? Were, uh, so at that moment, I had never heard of trial court Rule 12. Um, <laughs> like, okay. So I said, okay, and then I went and read trial court Rule 12 and realized that I couldn't do that. And at that point, he had issued his written order telling me to proceed through trial court rule 12. So at that point, I filed the interlocutory petition to the single justice of the appeals court. Okay. Because my view was that was the only way I could get the case back. Can I ask you a quick question yes. about 12? And, and I, I haven't read it, and you might know it a little bit better getting prepared. Could a litigant write a letter to the chief justice and say, hey, this case is in the wrong uh, department, and can you transfer it? Or is it only the judge that, that can make that request? Um, well, trial court rule 12 is a letter by a litigant. So if there are two or more actions pending and you want to consolidate them, which is not the situation here, then that a litigant can do that. That's what a litigant is supposed to do by writing that letter to the chief justice. But the thing that uh, this court has said repeatedly in situations like this where there's a single case with doubtful jurisdiction. That's what I mean. Is, could, is a, that, could a litigant have, could you have done that and say, 
hey, we're in the housing court, we can't be, we should be in superior. This court's never instructed litigants to do that, because this is all common law where, where this has come up. Mm -hmm. um, certainly this court, if this court wanted to say that in this case, that would be a relatively novel, because in all the cases that I've read, it's always been judges in courts of limited jurisdiction should report these sorts of cases. So I don't, how think, it, I don't think Chief Justice Locke would appreciate us yeah. inviting litigants to ask him. I think that's probably unlikely. Um, so I think the more <laughs> common practice is either sua sponte or I think more commonly a litigant alerts the judge to the serious jurisdictional defect and then the judge reports the case to the Chief Justice if the judge agrees that there is a serious jurisdictional problem here. Is there Thank any you. reason the housing court judge couldn't have just transferred it back? I, my position, as I laid out in my brief, is I believe it's within the inherent authority of a judge to transfer a case back to the proper court in which there's jurisdiction. So, And you're not aware of any impediment to that? I'm not aware of any impediment to that. I think the housing court judge, uh, sort of in his defense, was looking for a statutory equivalent to 185C Section 20, which allows transfers back. to the housing court. And I think he was sort of looking for like something that says like a, a housing court judge can transfer a case to the superior court and there's no impediment, but there's also no statutory authorization, which is why I think the source of the authority is just the inherent judicial authority of a judge to move a case over which he has no jurisdiction that was improperly transferred to his court. 